This is an interesting one, and I wonder how people around the country are going to feel, because, of course, England now has a completely different policy from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from mm. Wales. Do you think this is the right decision? Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I actually think it would be great if people from Scotland all descend on England and join in the party, because <laughs> we've absolutely had enough of sacrificing, sacrificing our freedom, our social life, our fun, for a, a disease that, for the majority of young people who want a party are not going to get ill and are not going to be in hospital and are not going to die. So, great. Party on. So this is the point about... I'm going to come to you, Benjamin, because I imagine you're, you're going to disagree with that. But would you accept that... I mean, the, apparently... The, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but the Omicron variant is a mild, a, a much milder mm. version of, the, uh, of the, the disease. So is there a case for what Kerry is saying? I mean, look, you know, I love dancing. People don't generally like to see my dancing, but I, I would. I, I enjoy doing <laughs> I'm sure it. you're a lovely mover. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, a month ago, I was gladly sort of going out and leading a normal life. I think the Omicron variant, in terms of the risk of getting it and having to isolate, is a mm. fundamentally different situation we're in, in terms of the, the risk level of getting it. Now, I think the, the evidence that came out from the UK Health Security Agency said that you're 50 to 70% less likely to be hospitalised with this version mm. of COVID than Delta, the previous prevalent one. Now, the problem is that the number of cases cases going round are more than double what they were for the previous sort of five months after we unlocked. And so in terms of, you know, hospitals being overwhelmed, yes. we're still in a similar position. Now, although I sort of disagree, I don't actually entirely disagree with the idea that we shouldn't lock down. I think, you know, locking down shouldn't be a routine public health lever. You know, it is an extreme measure, even though I agreed with the previous ones. I don't think there's any justification for saying that between people's different households, there should be limits. I can comprehend it for nightclubs or, you know, limiting who can be in pubs and restaurants and things, because the government can directly uh, give them money to try and fix that problem while using it as a public health measure. But I actually don't think they should stop people going between each other's houses at this point. So oh, you don't so. trust people Where to do make you reasonable that? decisions and you think they're all going to kill Granny unless you and the government decide that they should be restricted in some way by some measure. <laughs> well, because not... evidence shows that all the restrictions and lockdowns, all they've done is actually kill people. Well, that, of course, is, is not correct. Because Well, it is correct, isn't okay. it? Well, clearly well, let's, it's not. Let's just hear can, I, can, I, can I just ask, you, you said give them money. Where do you propose this money comes from? Well, I mean, the furlough funds and stuff. Look, it's been very expensive. Oh, There's no okay. doubt about hold it. On, Incredibly on. expensive. Can we, can okay. we go down well, that well, rabbit we're hole? Gonna, let's bring Esther in now. But what, what, what is your feeling about all of this, Esther? Enough. <laughs> Enough. Enough. Okay. March next year will be two years of this utter lunacy. Can we please have... I'm not asking for much. I just want an adult conversation. Not like the Brexit one where we had doomsday sort of um, news outlets on both ends. Yeah. I just want to have a, an, an adult public discourse on what living with COVID looks like. I don't want to hear anything about getting lateral flow, flow tests every day. I don't want to hear about not being able to bump into someone in a bar. What does life look like two years on from okay. this nightmare? But to take what Benjamin is saying here, I mean, his concern from what, from what you've said is more to do with the pressure on the NHS as opposed to, given that this is a... The NHS is strain. not built for... It's not the National COVID service. It's the National Health Service. I'm getting texts. I'm a healthy 25-year-old woman. I work out for like five days a week. I'm getting texts about getting a booster, but I can't see my GP. This is ridiculous. This is getting nuts. And then, we need to have a conversation about what living with COVID looks like with the recognition that it will always be around, no more lockdowns, because if that's the case, we're going to be locking down forever at some point in so our Benjamin, lives. So, Benjamin, do you accept that this is now a disease that we do have to learn to live with in some way and yeah. that we can't, therefore, just implement a lockdown whenever a new variant materialises? No, in many ways, I do agree with that. You know, the idea that we should have a lockdown like the one we had in the early months of, of this year, well, I don't think that would be justifiable at this stage because, because, you know, the problem is that people are in very different positions. So someone like me, who's 29... Uh, healthy with a little extra weight and has had, wonderful. has had three <laughs> vaccines is obviously at a very low risk. And so people are in de very different positions. The argument for a lockdown was always to slow the spread. Yes. The justification for that was everyone could get vaccinated, but, but, but we're not in that place exactly. With the Omicron variant, which is so much more transmissible than previous mm. variants, when you accept that this is actually the kind of thing we know we're all going to get it. We are all going to get this at some point, you know. And so, therefore, isn't this a more positive thing? We can see this as a possible step towards herd immunity for once. This might be something that we should now entertain as a serious thing. I'll come to you, Kerry. What do you think about this idea? Uh, well, I'm not wild about the herd immunity idea, but I think it's real. And for a younger generation that aren't going to get very ill, I think that's fine. I think for elderly and vulnerable people, that's more problematic. But hopefully, I don't mind if we have to have a booster every year. I think it'd be great if these new jabs and actually new pills that are coming out as treatments. But I do entirely agree with Esther 
that we should stop treating the NHS as this god mm. and when Church clearly the that deals with just COVID because Benjamin's restrictions and lockdowns, which were about preserving a public service mm. that's clearly not fit for purpose, if it hasn't got the elasticity to do with to deal with staff shortages and redeployment or to deal with cancer and heart attacks and kills people by moving them back into care homes with COVID. And in London, we know this week, a third of the Omicron infections are <laughs> happening when you've been in hospital for more than a week, which is yes. fairly frightening. So we have an NHS not fit for purpose. Don't try and solve it by punishing us. But it's isn't a service. Or sinking more money into it. It's like the black hole of public spending. Reform it. I mean, but that's... What, 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 what would that reform look like, though? I mean, how could you address we can't this even, particular But this issue? is the thing. We can't even have a conversation about reforming the NHS because we don't know what the country is going to look like a year from now, which is why the conversation about what living with COVID is so important. What is, if... if, if Businesses can't plan. Surely um, uh, our healthcare industry can't plan. Other industries can't plan. Nothing can happen if we don't have a conversation about what it looks like. You talk about living with COVID. Can you envisage any scenario where you would support any kind of lockdown? No. I, I envisage no. a scenario where people take responsibility for their health, which is what mm. we were doing before COVID, Even... and we should keep doing. So, Kerry, so you didn't support the first lockdown no, at all? No, not at all. And the, the... and the ludicrous nature of it. I mean, do you remember we couldn't sit on a bench? Homeless people could not sit on a pavement. You had to stand up. Homeless people have Everything been was taped l off. Lodgings, if they uh, get a, yeah. a jab. Which they... They should have. I don't think a lockdown can ever be justifiable because basically it says, as individuals within society, as citizens, we are incapable of making rational decisions about what's best for our family, our peers, our community, so when just... actually we're best placed to make those decisions. So let me clarify. Your, your, your solution would not be lockdown, therefore. It is about personal responsibility. If you are vulnerable yourself, shield yourself. And, take, take and shield yourself. and help your family and your neighbours and your friends and do what's wise. I think the government's role should be to advise, not to control. OK, well, Benjamin, do you want to come? But of course, text. let Benjamin come in on But, this. I mean, that doesn't make sense. And there's a reason why, you know, every government in the world of every different political persuasion worked out that Hold lockdowns... On, hang on, let me argue. No, I, I understand your point of view. But, uh, well, I'm coming round to it. That's what happens okay. when I speak. Uh, is that if they, <laughs> if, if they had lockdowns, because clearly... <laughs> <laughs> you can't... If you have COVID and you don't realise it, and uh -huh. the reason COVID was so dangerous was because of asymptomatic cases, right? That's yes. why it managed to spread in the way unlike others. And so it isn't good enough to say, certainly if we roll back to the start of this year and last year, it's not good enough to say, oh, well, I'm taking responsibility for myself because... If you don't know you've got it, you could have been killing someone else. And that's why, when it was at its most infectious and when we didn't have vaccines, so lockdown was necessary. So people, can I, can people I... can't understand that, Benjamin. So Only his, you his can. argument, wait, 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 his let, argument no, is think, Kerry, you should pretty... lock down your life hang on. you might give it to someone who wouldn't have can I, taken can I just, hang on, can I just yeah. Benjamin, Benjamin, everyone got that. Benjamin, can I, just phrase, can I just put this as a question for you? So I understand the point that, that you're making here, that effectively it's because you might inflict something on someone else. In other words, the responsibility isn't just about yourself. It's about it's spreading the virus. To, it's impossible to have individual risk in a contagious virus. But then would you apply that? So, for instance, this year, we'll, we know that flu, normal flu, is going to kill yeah. more people than Omicron. So would you uh, recommend or advocate uh, criminal restrictions against people going out for flu? No. What's Why not? the difference? Because the scale of which it, of how fast it spreads and the likelihood to kill someone, we know for a fact, is significantly more risky than it is for flu. And of um, we, we, we so it is. Actually. It is. That's completely wrong. It's not. Well, well, well there's, a re there's a reason far more people get sick from COVID than from flu. And actually, actually by the way, Ofcom it's rules incredible. State very flu has that somehow you can't vanished say that. this winter, which sorry, is incredible. Sorry, say that again. To me. Also, Ofcom rules are very clearly that you can't say that flu is, is like COVID. Well, the, COVID the is facts much more say dangerous. There's than flu. normally a thousand hospitalizations a day with respiratory diseases, and most of those are secondary infections from colds and flu or now Omicron. It's not a new phenomenon in that yeah. regard. But this is the point. Nobody was saying that the flu is the same as COVID. What we're making an analogy here. If you're saying that lockdowns are justifiable on the basis of the number of deaths or the possibility of spreading infection, that is surely applicable to other uh, uh, viruses, is it no, not? No, because, because as the because... church of COVID, you must worship at the feet of COVID. You must, you must bow down and fear COVID <laughs> because nothing else exists. In the... You know the NHS has to cater for other illnesses. That actually... And they can't do that if they're, if they're overwhelmed with COVID. No, cases. they can't do that That's we have a conversation lockdown. of what living with COVID looks like. Do you, do you because it's not going of, anywhere. Do you think part of the problem is that the NHS is struggling at the moment because so many people are off work? I mean, that's really what's happening here. And we're about is, to is fire it... more people in April who haven't got the jab, so that's... But, it, but it's not just that. It's, it's, it's the fact that people can't go into work if, if they live mm. with someone who is... 
who has COVID contracted positive. COVID or if they're suspected or if they have symptoms. Is that really the problem? And, and how would you possibly uh, seek to redress this? Because surely they're doing the right thing by staying at home, aren't they? Well, a good step, I know this may be revolutionary, would be not to fire people in the first place. But what do I know? You know, if we have staff shortages, maybe the, the right idea would be to fire more people. Who don't Terry, is it that simple? Uh, well, I don't, well, no, not particularly. I, I think that there needs to be... Um, you know, I, I would like to know mm -hmm. that there's been a huge recruitment drive so we don't have staff shortages. I would like to know why there can't be redeployment, why there isn't built-in elasticity. We built redundant Nightingale hosp hospitals on the back of a panic, mm -hmm. which were, I think, only 50 cases ever went into the one in London. Um, we have huge backlog of over 5 million people waiting for cancer and other vital treatment, not COVID. Yeah. And therefore, in my view, we should stop worshipping the NHS and demand that we have one fit for purpose. Does this We've built in elasticity. Let me just bring Benjamin in here. Does that concern you at all, is the possibility that people are missing important appointments for other... Uh, well, I'd say two things. First of all, the argument about the fact that clearly it wasn't uh, flexible enough and that it wasn't staffed appropriately is all perfectly reasonable and that you should reform it. But you can't do that in the middle of a pandemic. That's the last thing you have the ability to do when we're in a situation like this. So it's not really an answer to the questions that we face in the short term. On the one of, of the NHS dealing with people that don't have COVID, well, the argument is flawed because... If everybody, if you had far more people getting seriously sick with COVID, as was a much bigger risk at the start of this year and last year, then then it literally becomes impossible for them to treat other people because the NHS is overwhelmed with people sick with COVID. So that's why I just don't accept the argument that somehow lockdown caused the backlog. It would have been much worse if someone had got hit by a bus and couldn't get seen by a doctor well, because they were overwhelmed by COVID. Esther, cases. quickly, last word to you. Do you have anything to say about this view but there? The, I mean, I, can, I, I take the point that you can't really focus on restaffing during a pandemic because yes. people are not as mobile. But the argument is planning, right? You can't plan if you don't know what's going to happen. We need to have a serious conversation about what NHS would look like when there's always going to be COVID in society. Yeah. That's not going anywhere. There's no such thing as zero well, COVID. It, and this is the argument I've been making from the start. You can talk about lockdowns this or, you know, delaying the spread that. If we do not have an adult conversation about what we're willing to tolerate in the future and what actually living with COVID looks like, I don't... There, there's nothing else that can be said that matters. Well, you know, this is a fascinating debate. There's actually probably more common ground here than, than would seem...